Hmm. Let's see. Is there sound now? Is there sound? Please tell me in the chat if you can hear sound, if the sound is okay, if it's crackly. I want to make sure that we can hear properly. Uh, let me put the chat into the into the screen here so I can see it. Let me put my chat in. Again, sorry about this if you have been waiting. <coughs> Let me see. Uh, sound is back. Clear sound just now. Okay, good stuff. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Alish. Thank you. Sound and make. Okay. <coughs> I love the way some of you can do emo emojis and stuff. Well, welcome. Sorry for the delay. Welcome on Facebook and on YouTube. This is Goodness Christian Church, and this is our Kerygma School and our DLT for those who want to have the subship and leadership training. And we're in the whole area of Kerygma, or I should say the whole area of hermeneutics, which is how to interpret it and the Bible and read the Bible well and study the Bible well. And that's where we're at. So thankfully, uh, you all are in there. There's a fair few people in there. Good to see you. Hope you've all been saying hi to one another. I'm just going to pop over to Facebook because again, on Facebook, uh, there's not as many people uh, on Facebook, but sometimes when they do come in, did I go live there? And I do go in. I sometimes forget the people in Facebook. Well, good to have you tonight. And as we're going to continue on, this is number eight. This is number eight. We've covered the foundations. This is number eight. And you should have been able to print off uh, week by week maybe not the exact night but the next day for instance uh, last week's one was last week's one we had the whole diagram about the I don't know if you can see that can you we had the whole diagram with regards to a kind of a theological understanding of where you're at with interpretation the whole system from God is good all the way to how God wants to help us to understand what he's saying to interpret what he's saying to bring it into our lives to be able to proclaim it and then as we experience more of God's goodness through that truth and freedom but again it, the process even goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into grasping who God is and who we are in light of that and so we covered a fair few things last week now at the end of last week <clears throat> we covered some aspects that um, I didn't go deeply into but I touched on it because in one sense we'll be covering it deeper as we go along I started to talk about the fact that the book the Bible itself we see it and we already presume that you're a believer we presume that you believe the bible to be the word of god this classes this lectures study whatever way you want to call it is not about trying to convince you the word of god but it is the bible is the word of god but just to help you to understand how to interpret it well and so at the end of last week after we covering a number of subjects with regards to how to interpret it and the problems we have in interpretation and and the challenges of that, as I raised some of the red flags about uh, issues about, particularly about women leadership, and the whole area of that, and there's many other things, baptisms, different topics. But at the end of it, we talked about how the book is a divine book and also a human book. And because it's a divine book, and because it's a human book in a human historic context, that brings some issues. And we talked about a little bit about the historic context and the place of culture and experience and language I didn't we were running out of time as uh, such I didn't want to go deeper into it but the whole aspect of it's a thousand you know or many different orders 1500 years old so we have to bridge the gap and that's what I want to talk to you right straight away is we have five gaps that we need to bridge if we want to bring the truth of heaven that was spoken then to those people spoken then to them and bring it over to the here and now there's five areas particularly that we have to try and bridge we have to try and bridge that gap so that we can 
hear what God is trying to say to us today as we read the Bible, as we interpret it. Not only get an, a good exegesis, what God said then, which we'll cover, but also what God is saying now. So there's five particular areas that we need to do. Because the, these five areas, you already know, as we touched on already, there's there's a historical area, there's the language area, there's the whole area of culture, there's the area of philosophy, what they were thinking at the time and how the, their mindset is at the time and culture in that sense also connected to it. And then there's also an area of spirituality. Now, when we have these historical gaps, if we don't overcome these his historical gaps, we can come up with very strange and weird teaching or teaching is imposed we mightn't be we mightn't be trying to misinterpret the scripture but we can misinterpret it in so many ways because we're not putting in that work in and, and we're miss missing the whole context outside context and internal context of the text itself and if we're going to be genuine christians and disciples of jesus and and spirit-filled believers we need to hear what god was saying then very clearly and so there's a number of contexts that we need to put into place probably the one that is the most easiest to understand straight off of course is the historical gap that there's a huge history between even the time of jesus and us there's two thousand years between the time of paul and us two thousand years and that's a huge gap and we have to bridge bridge that historical gap and see even the historical context of Pharisees and Sadducees and, and the historical context of uh, what does it mean when he slept in a manger you know what does that mean what was a manger there's a lot of historical context in that what was it like to live under Roman rule many things like that and then going back into the Old Testament even more so there's a huge historical difference between our life and the life of uh, Abraham or the patriarchs or Moses so there's a hu huge historical gap so we need tools to help us to bridge the gap because when the author say Moses was writing at the time he didn't have to explain a lot of things he didn't have to explain the historic context they were living in the historic context but for us today for us to fully understand sometimes what he's saying and why he's saying what he's saying we have to grasp that historical context um, you know, the early church people knew what a Pharisee was. Now, maybe maybe not all of them did when they were in Rome, I'd say. But when the Jews, the first early church, most of them did understand. So when Jesus talks about or talking to the Pharisees or the way they were interacting, there were so many things that they just had in them already that didn't need to be explained. Whereas for you and I, we don't have that luxury. There's huge gaps. And so in the historic, a, a good example that I would like to use is this, is when I was studying the book of Jonah, and when I was um, first read the book of Jonah, you know, the first time I read it, like, why didn't he want to go to Nineveh? What was his reluctance? Why did he avoid doing it? What was the problem that he didn't want to go to? Was he just being selfish? What was, what was the issue? And not only that, when he did go there, why was he so bitter when you know, the people started to repent and he's waiting for them to all be destroyed. If you know the story of Jonah, of course, you know, he ran away and then he ended up in the belly of the fish. And, and then he came out of the belly of the fish and then he walked through the city and calling the people to repent. And then they did repent or they, at least they were repenting. And he sat by a tree waiting to see the judgment or such. He sat in the sun waiting for the judgment to, to come upon the Ninevites. Uh, why was that? And now... Offhand, you might think there was something about Jonah that was just, you know, being, you might have all kinds of ideas. You might even have deep spiritual ideas. But when you get the historic context and you know that the Ninevites, who were not Jewish, nothing to do with Israel, nothing to do with a faraway country, they were very cruel. They were, they were uh, conquerors. They conquered many nations. They conquered and they fought Jewish people as well, but many nations. And they were considered extremely cruel and barbaric when they took over places. Extremely vile and cruel and torturous and barbaric. And so there was a whole historic reason, there's a context why 
Jonah did not want to go to the Ninevites. And then when he did go and he did preach, there's a kind of a, a context to why his tone was, okay, I've done my job, now God judged him. That he didn't have, even though he did what he was called to do eventually, that there wasn't necessarily a, a much mercy in his tone. Now, you only begin to understand why that was when you see the suffering of many people and maybe the suffering context of Jonah himself and his family. That gives you a historical context to his attitude and helps you to interpret what was going on at the time and why he was reluctant and why he was so, his tone was so somewhat bitter or overly judgmental and how God had to deal with that. And that helps us then in our context of how to interpret it when we bridge the historical gap of what the message might mean to us today as God's Holy Spirit is speaking to us today, the principles and the truth applications that can apply to us today. So that's in the historical context. That's just one example. And then the second thing, as I said, <clears throat> there's a number of gaps. The second one is that I would highlight is the cultural gap. A uh, cultural gap can come in all many different forms and shapes and manners, you know, people's customs, the cultural way of doing things uh, that would seem maybe even abhorrent to us, such as slavery, for instance. Slavery was extremely common in that world. Now, it wasn't always the way we think of slavery. At times it was. You know, we often think of slavery in such just bad terms always. But no, sometimes it was considered um, a way of surviving. It was, you know, if I remember, if I remember even in the New Testament times, it was something like 70% of people were slaves. If I remember, forgive me, I should have looked that up. If I remember, it was 70% of people were slaves. 70%. So it wasn't the way that we might think today, you know, only in, in terms of bad terms. There was a different things. And sometimes people would literally bind themselves as a slave to uh, uh, an owner or whatever way you want to call it. Uh, and they would do that because they would actually see that it was a good thing for them and their family. It was security and so forth and so on. <clears throat> so there's cultural issues that we have to overcome when we when we talk about these things that, that these cultural difference, cultural difference with regards to male, female, cultural differences with regards to marriage. For instance, today in our thinking, for anybody to be uh, arranged, married, it, to us, it might seem a little bit odd. Maybe not in some countries, but in the Western world, it can seem very odd. So we have to be careful when we're, and even in, in other parts of the world, it wouldn't be the same possibly as the time of the Bible. So we have to be careful as we're, again, interpreting the scripture and not to overjudge the motives and the intents of people's hearts. Because there could be a whole lot of thing at play there that is totally out of our context, out of our cultural context. And we could be judging the situation in a wrong way, in a harsh way, and not really getting what God is trying to say to them then and to what he might be saying to us now as we're distracted by our own culture. Uh, the way I like to put it a little bit now, this is in the context of all the five gaps. As we're dealing with historic gap, as we're dealing with cultural gap, and now we'll also deal with a, a, a gap that we've already dealt with, but in the context of all the gaps, the way I like to put it is this, is it's like you're a fish in a, an aquarium. You're a fish in an aquarium and you're at one end of the table or at the other side of the room. And there's another aquarium at the other end of the table or the other side of the room. And we're like fish with a big gap between looking at other fish. And then thinking about what's going on there and why are they doing what they're doing and why are they doing it that way and stuff. And, and there's a gap between us. First of all, the two tanks might be a little bit different in its layout. The two tanks might have a few different types of fish in it, different types of people as such fish. But also there's the issue of each tank might have a different thickness of glass. And so there can be a lot of distortion. So we're not like, when we're interpreting what God is trying to say through the Bible, that we're looking at the God, what he's saying, but the human context of what he's bringing it through. We're looking at other humans. It's not like as if we can totally uh, take our, ourselves away from it and pretend as if we're scrutinizing or studying a, um, a mouse or something or, 
you know, that we're observing without our own uh, cultural hang-ups, blessings and all that goes between it, our own historic background, our own context. So we're like fish in one aquarium, looking at the fish in another aquarium as the master's hand is working in that other aquarium and we're trying to interpret what's going on. And so, and that might be a, a strong illustration, but you know, so we have to be careful as we're, as we're seeing that there's a gap, there's a glass, there can be distortion from our own perspective. And so to be humbly aware of that and then to do our utmost to bridge that gap. The third gap that I would look at is the linguistic gap. Now we've covered a fair bit about the linguistic gap in a sense because some of that work is already done for us with the scholars who have taken the true critical text, you know, manuscripts, critical, critical text, and then translations, ling linguistics. But there is still a linguistic gap that we should be aware of even in our English translations, the idioms that are being said. And, and to be aware of that, particularly as we use maybe more word for word study Bibles, because the idiom might be lost or the meaning might be lost and it hasn't been given to us. And maybe a scholar might know it, but because he's doing a word for word translation, he doesn't bring out the meaning of the idiom. Where then, of course, if we're reading a more uh, dynamic or um, not formal, if we're reading more, not the formal, functional equivalent or the dynamic equivalent, then maybe the scholar has helped us with that idiom and what it meant. But then was he right in the way he helped us, you know, the emphasis or whatever. So we, but when we do come across sayings or idioms, <clears throat> what they might have been trying to say, we're to be aware of that. And that's very important because the linguistics gap is, is all around us. We've talked a little bit about these linguistic gaps. One of the ones that I, I like to use sometimes is, could you imagine if I was in Cork City, in the center of Cork City, and I'm on the phone, I'm talking to someone, but suddenly I bump into a mother, I bump into a mother from the church and, uh, you know, they have a baby with them, a toddler with them and nice clothes, a girl or a boy, but nice clothes. And I turn, no, I wouldn't necessarily turn around and say this, but most Cork, Cork people would say it. You know, if I turned around to the mother and looked at the, and I'm still on the phone and I turn around to the, to the mother and say, and it's a baby girl, let's say, and I'd say, isn't she massive? She is so massive. And on the other end of the phone, I'm talking, I just happen to say, would you hold for a second? And they're listening in and it's a friend of mine, say, from Germany. And this friend of mine from Germany has very good English, but doesn't know the idioms and the sayings and the phraseology that is more local to not only Ireland, because you wouldn't necessarily say that in, in Waterford, but even Cork idioms. Isn't she massive? Now, if you've been reared in Cork and, and grown up in Cork, you would probably know that what I'm trying to emphasize is, isn't she beautiful or isn't she pretty? Isn't she lovely? I'm not trying to reference in any way the size of the child. And I'm definitely not trying to say the child is overweight. Now, but my German friend who's listening in is probably saying, my goodness, you're very, you're very straightforward telling the mother that the child is a bit big or maybe overweight. So the idiom that you use, and there's plenty of idioms in culture, in, and that's only in Cork. And now between Cork and Waterford, you wouldn't say that, between, uh, you know, Cork and Germany or whatever. And even in maybe, maybe 50 years from now, or maybe 50 years back, you wouldn't have said that phrase, isn't he massive, or isn't she massive? Meaning an endearing sense of isn't she beautiful or pretty, or, you know, that kind of way. So again, idioms are important. So we need to recognize that as we're reading the Bible, certain phrases and to do our best, even in ones we think we know, to do our best to get the sense of it and even the emphasis, because we might know it, but we might know its emphasis and to do our best with that. So that's another culture, that's the, the third cultural gap. <clears throat> but there's another gap, not only is there historic, not only is there cultural, not only is there linguistics, but there's also a cultural gap, or I should say a gap, a philosophy gap. Now, when we're thinking about that is that there's many things that in the world of both, say, the Syrians or the world of the Philistines or the world of Babylonia or the world of the Roman world or the Greek world, 
there were many thinking or belief systems <clears throat> that is different than ours today. So different that we're not always sure, you know, you know, we're not connected with them. Or even in the Jewish circles, you know, there was the Sadducees and there was the Pharisees. And in one of the writings, even one of the authors tries to explain the difference between some of the difference anyway, between the belief systems of a Sadducee and a Pharisee. A Sadducee, for instance, did not believe in the resurrection where Pharisees did. So we see those kind of inputs to try and help, even then, trying to help us to get the context, the philosophical context of the actual uh, receivers or the context of the re why the teaching is the way it is. So again, we have to do our best to understand what was the beliefs at the time? What was the thinking at the time? That's where things like the Dead Sea Scrolls, things like historic context, what they were thinking, all of that helps as we interpret the scripture. It helps us to bridge the gaps so that we can actually read better. So if you're going to be a good interpreter of the scripture, you've got to know there is gaps and then also then to be attentive and to work and to put your mind to, to try and bridge those gaps as best as you can with as much time or energy that you have. But to be aware, humbly aware, that what you're reading, and particularly if there's a phrase or there's a, a situation that you've got to be careful that you are reading within the context, within the historical context, the cultural context, the linguistic context, and even the philosophical idea or context that might be going on. For instance, when John is writing the Gospel of John, in the Word was the beginning, and the, you know the Word was made flesh. And when he talks about the Word, and he talks about things like that. There was already certain Greek mindsets, certain philosophy mindsets that, to some degree, John was hitting at. And even Paul, as well, also when he's writing, he hits at some things when he's talking to the Corinthian church. With regards to this philosophy, say for instance, of knowledge, of, of getting knowledge and understanding through knowledge and, and really a kind of a, a more intellectual, doctrinal, secret knowledge type understanding and that really brings you to uh, the place of blessing. Whereas we would talk about, and in John would and, and Paul would, about the relationship and trying, understanding why they were saying what they were saying in the context of the philosophy of teaching at the time helps you to in interpret it, what the author is trying to get at. What is he dealing with? What's the problem he's dealing with? Also at the time, you know, there might be different beliefs in about, as I said, resurrection, Sadducees, Pharisees. There might be different beliefs in the sense of dualistic understanding that the material world was always there just as the spiritual world was always there. And so <clears throat> is there some aspects of that that comes into the teaching when Paul or John or any of them are speaking about certain subjects. So there's a philosophical understanding or the belief systems of the people, both in the Jewish circles, but also in the non-Jewish circles, by which we sometimes have to bridge that gap to get an understanding, as Paul is writing, say, to the Gentiles, or even John for that matter, or writing to the Jewish people, uh, which grouping of Jewish people, the Roman soldiers, the god -fearers, what kind of belief systems were already there when we say god fear or what do we mean by a god fear what was their already beliefs what was their connections and to help us then to work out what god is trying to say to them then and the communication and then to us today now there is a fifth gap the fifth gap is a little bit different the fifth gap i we've already alluded to it and I, I'll probably go a little bit deeper into it later, but I just want to touch it. It's the spirituality gap. The spirituality gap. There's aspects of the spirituality gap in many different ways. First of all, Paul talks about in the sense of the spirituality gap, and, and even when he's writing to, even when he's writing to believers at the time back then, talking about the spirituality gap in the sense of some are spiritually mature, and they can take more solid food. And some are spiritually immature and they cannot take solid food. And so we see that there can be a spirituality gap in interpretation then back then. And then also there's that greater spirituality gap in that aspect between those who are spiritually mature now and those who are not may maybe spiritually mature. That they have a spirituality gap both with the text of now but also even with the text of then as well. And so there's a somewhat of even a greater gap by which we need the work of the Holy Spirit by which we need the help of other believers, the Catholic Church. When I say the Catholic, I mean the universal, the full body. 
that we need the help of the full body both in the past and also in the present to help us to interpret the scripture well. We don't interpret the scripture really as an individual. There's aspects of that, but really we're called to interpret the scripture as a body. And therefore, if, if the whole body is saying one thing regarding a, a text that is plain and simple or regarding some text that is difficult, because it takes a maturity to really think it through, that we should listen very carefully to the Catholic, to the, to the holistic, to the worldwide church, whether they be the Christians from America or South America, whether they be Episcopalian or whether they be Methodist, that we should, or Baptist or Pentecostal or whatever, that we should listen very carefully so that we can interpret it well. So there's that spirituality gap, but that spirituality gap goes in another few directions as well. Jesus alluded to it this way. You're probably familiar with the text in John's Gospel in chapter 3 about being born again. Well, in John's Gospel chapter 3, it talks about being born again. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And coming into God's rule and reign and bringing God's blessing. But Jesus went even further. He said in John's Gospel chapter 3 verse 3, he said, Very truly I said to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. So there's this spirituality gap in the sense of, are you a Christian? And that's why one of the presumptions were at the beginning, particularly for this course, is that you are already a Christian. Because if you're not a believer encountering God in the depth of your spirit and relationship already, there is a spirituality gap by which it will stop you from being able to see the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God, at work in your life and the lives of others around you, and also what the Spirit of God and the Kingdom of God is trying to convey through the Scriptures. There's going to be a spirituality gap. Now, that goes in deeper measure in other ways as well. Let me refer to, say, for instance, in Romans, where it talks about very clearly those who are turned their heart away from God, that God will give them over to a mind that is, as they keep refusing God, keep refusing God, that God will give them over to a mind, but also that they will reject or... Um, exchange the truth of God for a lie and that their minds will become more and more dulled as they go down that path. So that's creating a very big spirituality gap. But there's other aspects of the spirituality gap even for today as I alluded to. Paul talks about that we have uh, for those who are spiritually mature there are spiritual words. There is aspects of the scripture. There's aspects of the truth that is in scripture that only the spiritually mature can actually bring it together and see what is really going on and there. And the immature could take that word and go off on a tangent and make something out of it that is not there or just not really interpret it well. Not because they're not believers, not because they probably don't sincerely want to actually interpret the word, but because they haven't chewed it properly, they haven't had the spiritual maturity of practice or to actually bring it into their life in a holistic way or they're, not, they're immature and they're not really listening to the body, to the body as the body is interpreting that passage of Scripture or that aspect of Christian life and spirituality. So there is spiritual words that only those who have developed their spirituality in their relationship with Jesus, in their relationship with God, and also, I would say, as they practice the Word of God, as they practice struggling with it, living it out, as they can, you know, those who have got much, Will, more will be given to them. That as they do that, they can actually mature, they're mature so they can actually eat better or eat more difficult aspects. Peter himself alluded to, and I, I talked about it, Peter himself alluded to the fact that some people twist even what Paul is saying because some things that Paul is saying are hard to understand. And some people deliberately twist it, as I talked about in Romans, they reject the truth for their own reasons, whatever. And eventually they actually go into wrong, totally wrong way of thinking and screwed up thinking. So there's that spirituality gap. And then there's also with that, depending on the integrity of the heart is a huge one and where a person is willing to struggle with the truth or not. You know, that aspect, God will not teach you if you don't really want to hear him. So there's that aspect. But there's also uh, talks about in scripture, it talks about how, the devil is actually blinding the minds of unbelievers. That there is also the spirituality gap with the work of the evil one that can be working as well. So we got to be aware that the evil one tries to snatch the word away. The evil one tries to choke the word. The evil one tries to, uh, you know, blind people from the truth. 
And so we got to be aware that there's also that spiritual aspect where the evil one will try and even sow seeds of, of doubt and fear, twisting the scriptures. As we somewhat talked about last week with regards to when Peter was talking about Paul, but it also says in the scripture talking about how he blinds the minds of unbelievers. There's that, that aspect of the evil one. So again, that creates a spiritual gap. And so how do you how do you overcome that spiritual gap? How do you overcome that historic gap? How do you overcome that cultural gap? How do you overcome the linguistics gap? How do you overcome the philosophy gap? And that's what we're about, overcoming those gaps as best as we can. In a nutshell, overcoming the historical gap comes with understanding a historical context. Again, understanding the cultural context, understanding the philosophies of the time that were going on to grasp that, to basically you have to somewhat study a little bit through the help of preachers, teachers, to the help of um, commentaries, to the help of maybe footnotes, you have to think about what is the context in those ways. To overcome the spiritual gap is really a heart matter. That's a little bit harder. Now we can help other people overcome the spiritual gap through our prayer, praying for, as Paul says, I pray that you have the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that you may know the hope and the calling of God, you know, that we can pray for that the evil one would not be influencing uh, unduly any member of our church, any member of who we're ministering to, that we can bind the evil one as he's bound in heaven, that we can bind his influence on earth. Now, of course, if somebody is deliberately wanting to be deceived, it doesn't matter how much binding you do, because as soon as you bind that thing, they're letting it in again. So there is a heart issue, but in the warfare, in the spiritual warfare, both for ourselves and for those around us, that if we genuinely are open in any way and other people are open, if we do also call upon the Holy Spirit, call upon through the name of Jesus and in the name of Jesus exercise authority, that to bind what is bound in heaven, to bind it here and to loose what is already loosed in heaven, the, the revelation, the light of God, and to, you know, also to encourage one another to speak the word of God boldly as we should in whatever context we're in. All those aspects are part of this overcoming the spiritual gap. And the spiritual maturity, of course, is trying to help somebody actually, before you can teach them a whole lot, is tr trying, don't try and teach them more than what they can handle, you know, to be artful, somewhat manageable and scientific as well, but artful in helping to make sure that you bring someone as deeper into Christ as they can with what they have before you try and give them too much more because they'll choke. They, they just won't be able to handle it. They just they just won't. You're 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 probably not only going to waste your time, which is not a good thing, your energy and so forth. You won't get the effect that you want, and not only that, you might even choke them. You might even you might even start choking on on it. So we're called to be wise, both for ourselves as well, for ourselves. So a big thing is, where's your heart? Where's your heart when you're reading the scriptures? Is your heart open to what God has to say? And then when God has spoken, how you, are you struggling with what God has spoken to you already? Because why would he give you more if you're not already doing what the Holy Spirit is perfect, already trying to do what God has already called you to do? Now he's merciful. Thank God for God's mercy. Amen and amen. Now, there's another... Um, aspect that I want to tell you, talk to you a little bit about. It's it's not a gap as such, but it's more it's more of an issue. It's an issue about as we go deeper, as we talk about interpretation and the different forms of interpretation, about taking it literally, figuratively, all these aspects of, of scripture. I want to deal with something straight away and give you a thought of something straight away as we go forward. And it's this idea of that as we're reading the Bible, is there a deeper meaning that even the author did not understand? Now, we've got to be careful with this one. Let me give you an example. If you've got your Bible, maybe you want to turn to it because I'm not putting it up on the screen. Actually, I just realized there, am I on full screen or am I on? Oh, I've got the chat up there. Okay. I take it that, uh, I take it that the, the sound is still good. Somebody tell me the sound is still good. Uh, nobody's saying the sound has gone off, so I take it the sound is still good. Okay. I just realized I still had the chat up there. Let me bring it on full screen. 
and there. If you've got a Bible, please uh, grab a Bible. Now, if you're watching on YouTube on your phone, if you come off, it's the, unless you have a paid prescription, you'll actually close it. Um, so just be careful there if you, if you do that. But if you've got a Bible, just grab open the Bible and maybe follow along with me in this one. This is a little bit of a tricky issue. And I will tell you, it's a bit of a tricky issue. It's this idea that sometimes the authors themselves may by the Holy Spirit, because it's a divine book and a human book, that the authors themselves mightn't have always seen the deeper meaning going on. Not only the hearers, but even the authors themselves. Let us turn to a passage of scripture, if you wouldn't mind. It's in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 12. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 and 12. Let me read it to you there. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come upon you shared or searched intently with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even the angels long to look into these things. So here Peter did clearly say that they were searching intently the scriptures, the prophets themselves. To grasp the time and the circumstances that the Spirit of Christ within them was alluding to when he would come and the salvation that would come. And then also that as they spoke these things, when they were preaching about them, that they weren't really serving themselves or even serving their time fully. That they were serving a time yet to come. And that even the angels themselves look into these things. So that would give a sense that in some sense, the Old Testament, some of the Old Testament prophecies, some of the Old Testament authors, that when they were writing, that even though they were writing back then, there, and the audience was back then, there, that to some degree, both the audience and even the authors themselves didn't always grasp what they were saying. Not only the audience, but even the authors. That they also intently searched with the greatest of care, trying to understand what Christ was pointing to, the circumstances and times. And that they were for the people of the New Testament time, particularly the time of Jesus. You know, we have that prophecy, for instance, that prophecy uh, or that teaching, that understanding when the, the high priest, you know, he rips his garment and he says, isn't it better that one man should die for all? And he even says, alluded to there, that he didn't even fully grasp what he was saying himself, but yet he was preaching out or proclaiming a spiritual truth of the substitute sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, for all people. Now, in context, uh, the actual high priest might have been saying it's better that he would die than we all end up dead because of the Romans coming in because he's proclaiming himself as a king. That there's a, sometimes a deeper meaning going on that God is alluding to that we are to grasp. Now, is that something only for the New Testament, though? Or again, with the book of Revelation and the prophecies of Jesus, is there sometimes things spoken about to us or some of the parables that is hidden that is to be revealed? Now, we're in we can be in danger in these things as well. But before I even talk about the danger, I do want to bring it out very clearly even more so. If you've got your Bible, please turn to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, of course, is very much a, has a lot of aspects of prophetic aspects in it Daniel being a prophet uh, but also being in Babylonia at the time and here he is as a prophet speaking out things for the Jewish people and prophesying in many ways if you got the book of Daniel open I want you to turn to chapter 12 verse 8 in the book of Daniel chapter 12 verse 8 it says simply Daniel is talking and he says this I heard but I did not understand so I asked my Lord what will the outcome of this be? So even Daniel somewhat alludes to the aspect that he, even though he heard the words and heard what God was saying, that he himself too did not understand exactly what they meant. 
Now there is a danger here though, because then people can end up taking the scripture and trying to find meaning, double meaning where there is none and go all over the place. So even if this is true, we have to be careful about it, very careful. And particularly when it comes to other aspects of the scripture that is clearly just plain and simple what it's saying. That obviously Peter at some sense was talking about the prophetic prophecies concerning the Messiah and his coming and to understand what that was about and when he would come and the times and, and stuff like that and all of that. And the Jewish people, a lot of them did try to find out when the time was and all that. But it was really for the people, no matter how much they were trying, it was really for the people of the time and particularly even just after the the reality, say, of Jesus and his ministry, after the reality of Jesus on the cross. It's only somewhat during or after the reality that the prophecies made sense. There's a key also for us today about trying to find the nitty gritty times and everything about prophecy. To some degree, you will not there's many prophecies you will not be able to fully grasp until they're actually happening or have happened just as they didn't so be careful about you know trying to focus that as your attention or your whole aspect of of wanting because you can come up with all and they did come up with all kinds of crazy ideas and stuff like that and there was many different jewish groupings that did you know the maccabees and all the kinds of stuff there was many who claimed to be the messiah and so forth and so on and what that even meant so when we're looking at that we have to be careful there's many passages of scripture that are absolutely clear and there's no hidden meaning but then we also just have to realize you know is there something deep here that god is trying to say to us so this is a careful one this is a very we have to be very careful with this one because of course some people then go into all kinds of things where they see deeper meanings in every type of scripture and that's actually one of the schools of interpretation that we will look at where the allegory school of interpretation that developed where they were looking for different levels of meaning into nearly every text of scripture not just prophecy every text of scripture and how that can come up with weird and wacky stuff and maybe not the best way to interpret scripture so with that in mind, I'm actually, that's it. Actually, we're short tonight. Yeah. I'm not going to go on to anything else now at this moment because otherwise we'll get caught into something bigger. I hope you've been blessed. Uh, again, to, if not tonight, tomorrow morning, the, the pamphlet will be up for this. Uh, again, if you see any spelling mistakes or anything like that, please let me know. I'm dyslexic. Uh, I won't be getting offended. Uh, again, if you want to get, if you want to print off the pamphlet, some people ask me, how do you get it? Remember, it's in the description. It's in the description below the video. So you have to, there's a little arrow. If you're watching on a YouTube, on, a, on an iPad or on a phone, there's a little tiny arrow by the video that you click that and a description will come down and all the links and everything will be there. Now, not straight away, but maybe um, in a day or two, what I've also done with all the previous videos so far is I've put in time codes as well. And the time codes have headings. They're in the description, but also if you go back to the previous videos on YouTube, that is, you will also see little kind of gray slots on the end of the video by which you can jump into like chapters within each video. I'm trying to do that now to aid in study or to aid in going back to any aspect of it. Now, there will be a time when we need to meet up, either physically meet up or meet up via Zoom so that we can do the other aspect of charisma. Those of you who are going for credit as such, the other aspect of charisma is that discipleship aspect and also so just creating a space for questions and answers and discussions and to bring that out. It would be about an hour long, that type of thing. We need to either do it via Zoom or via physically meet up. Some, of course, are not even in, in Cork City. Those of you who are not in Cork City, of course, or close to Cork City, of course, for you, it would be via Zoom, of course. But those of you in Cork City, whether we'll do a hybrid thing of meeting up together and maybe having some people in on the meeting via Zoom. Those who are part of the part of the getting, how to say, the DLT licensing um, for this. So again, again, not too late, not too long. I hope that gave you some value, some blessing. Be blessed and be a blessing. If you have any questions there, anything you want to discuss there in the chat, please do so right now. As before we're heading out uh, the door or such sound is uh, is great I'm glad to hear sound is good 
Uh, Peju, it's good to see you. Sheila, good to see you. Ross, good to see you. Alish, good to see you. Martin, hey, good to see you, Martin. Uh, I know some of you are just popping in and just doing the study without wanting to do get uh, credit as such for it. And that's okay too. Uh, some people are also who are doing it for credit are not necessarily live. They're doing it after the fact. And again, remember, if you're doing it after the fact, remember to place a comment in the actual commentary. Something, something you got out of it, something. It doesn't matter what it is, but place it in there. I want to know that you've been here. Uh, otherwise, I, you know, I can't in my heart to say that you've actually covered the material. Uh, we won't be doing any major test or anything like that. We might have a bit of an MCQ, a small MCQ thing, but uh, that would be just a small thing. Great stuff. No questions coming up. Of course, there's a little bit of a time delay. Let me go over to Facebook and see if there's in Facebook. Uh, there's one or two people on Facebook. Hi, Christopher. Good to see you. Hi, Jamie. It's good to see you, Jimmy. Uh, Ellen. Hi, good to see you, Ellen. I don't know if you're still in here, but it's good to see you guys if you're still here. Just treat people in anyway. Uh, it's good to see you. So, blessing again. So, tonight we've covered the whole aspect of the five gaps and then also the deeper meaning. That's what we covered tonight. The five gaps and then also the aspect of is there a double or deeper meaning to the actual text and how that might be true but also how it might be something that we have to be very careful about. Amen and amen. Be blessed and be a blessing. Uh, I just go one more time back into YouTube in case there's a question. No question after coming up. No, nope. great stuff. God bless you. Remember, God wants to teach you the word of God. You have intelligence, you have all that, you have normal human faculties, the Holy Spirit is also with you, wanting to help you to interpret it well, so you can bring it into your life well and also bring it into the life of others well. And the seed of God's word, when sown into a heart that is open to God's truth, makes fruitful living both now and for eternity. And so you're endeavoring to plant it well, to get the seed planted well in your heart. And that's a good endeavoring to do both for yourself and those whom you influence to have a sound mind as you're reading the scriptures and bringing it to your life and the lives of others. Be blessed and be a blessing. God bless you.